Hello, I'm H. Wayne Wilson, and as always, we welcome you to At Issue. And this time around, we're going to be talking about Ronald Reagan because we're coming up on a birthday. February 6th will mark a century of Ronald Reagan, had he still be al been alive. And to help us with that conversation, the curator of the Ronald Reagan Museum over at Eureka College, Dr. Brian Psycho. thank you so much okay. for being with us. Thanks, H. And across the table from Brian is Martin Anderson. Martin, uh, we're going to talk about everything in just a moment, but he's with, uh, he's a Reagan scholar and uh, with uh, the Hoover Institution where he's a fellow. And uh, his wife, Annalise Anderson, also at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Hi. Thank you all for being with us. Sure. Before we start talking about uh, Ronald Reagan, I want to make sure the audience understands the particular vantage point that you bring to the table. You actually worked in the Office of Management and Budget, uh, 81 to 83? That's right. I had five cabinet departments and 40 agencies whose budgets I was responsible for. And you worked for a couple of presidents. Yes. Uh, Nixon. Rich, Richard Nixon. Reagan. Yeah, for Reagan, we, we did it twice. When he... Well, we worked in the 76 campaign That's and true. then the 80 campaign well, and then both, both, the, both of okay. us and in the Reagan he, White he House. He lost on that one and he came in mm -hmm. and then we did, and then we waited wait a, a, a long time there. That's true. Uh, we are going to show you a, a short clip in a moment about uh, the Eureka College Museum that is dedicated to Ronald Reagan. We'll, we'll see about two and a half minutes of some of the artifacts that are there. But uh, first, I want to talk just in general about what was unique about Ronald Reagan. We always hear, we, you know, the great communicator. And he was. He had a background, you know. That's true good at, in Hollywood, he was good on radio, um, but it wasn't just communication, was it? No. What made him so special? A couple of things. One of the things that I always was amazing with uh, uh, Reagan, for example, when we worked with him, he never yelled at us. He never did anything to us. He never said to other people what they should be doing, and he would listen very carefully. And he was very, he was probably around 200, he was incredibly smart and quick. And uh, you would hand him some information, and next thing you know, he knew about everything about it. And what was fascinating about him is that he never got into a problem with a lot of other, other people. We, th we thought so, but he never did. And uh, she knows that. Annalise knows these because she worked with a lot of them and tell him what, what, he, what, he, what he was doing. Well, I, th I, think, I think Reagan was not only a, a great communicator, but he was a thinker and uh, a strategist, yes. and he planned what he wanted to do, and he knew, as he told Martin in an interview in 89, shortly after he left office, he said, I, I had a plan. I knew what I wanted to do, and one of the most important things he wanted to do was to prevent the United States from being placed in the situation by the Soviets where, where they had to either give in to an ultimatum or or go to war, go to nuclear war. And he wanted to avoid nuclear war and, and to achieve peace without surrender. And so he really knew what he wanted to do. And the fact that he did that, he didn't explain in advance to everybody what he wanted to do or how he was going to do it or what his ultimate goals were, but he had them and he did it. I think it was important too. He wasn't, uh, you know, that he wasn't a career politician, and I think that's important. It was for him because when he decided to become involved in government and politics, um, he had had a career and had lots of money. But his what drove him was that he he knew he had to give back to America. It was his that servant leadership piece that was driving him to make a difference, and so that vision was carried all the way through. He was doing it to make America better. He wasn't doing it to, to please people just to get elected or just to, because he didn't have to. He didn't need that. There are many recollections we can talk about in a moment, but first I, I want to talk about the influence that Eureka College had on Ronald Reagan. And of course, he's a Midwesterner, born in Tampico, raised in Dixon, a short time in Galesburg, I believe, and went to, to Eureka uh, 1928 to 32. That's right. Mm -hmm. What was it, uh, Brian, you can start us off, about his upbringing at Eureka that influenced his later life? Well, I think a core piece to it really was 
the church connection, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Uh, the northern branch of that church really were staunch abolitionists and believed in the equal rights of all people and that education was the way out. And so um, he'd heard about this sort of utopia growing up in Dixon from his mother. And then uh, when, he, when he came to Eureka, it was all there. I mean, there was uh, the last surviving member of his class is uh, Willie Sue Smith Stewart, who's now 100 years old this, this summer. And she's an African-American woman from Houston, Texas. So she had to come all the way from Houston to come to school. Less than 1% of the population were uh, a college population were uh, women. Uh, be, being that you bring that up, uh, let's talk about, we all know that Ronald Reagan was known for ending the Cold War. We all know that uh, he had a, a profound impact on the U.S. economy. But what we don't talk about is human rights. And you bring that up, and I, I want to uh, re recall the story about Berge Berghart. He was on the, uh, on the line for the Eureka football team, played right sure. next to Ronald Reagan. He was an African-American. And it was an, that experience and others that led him to say, you know, all people are equal. That's true. And he would just do it. He would see what, what happened. I, I remember now reading about that. And uh, they weren't going to take that guy in. He wasn't going. They weren't going to let him feed. They weren't going to let, at, let at, at a hotel. Where let they, him, they were. Yeah, they weren't let him stay right. at, a, at a hotel when and, they were traveling yeah. with the football And he team. basically said, "Well, we're not going to go into it. They're going to come in with us." And they went in there. Go ahead, you would take right. it. So Reagan That's it. took them to his own house. house yeah. Right, he did. And yeah. you remember, this comes from a, a school that had integrated athletic teams, and so they had faced that a number of times, but a defining moment for Reagan and, and for Berghardt, who became a, a chemistry professor at major universities, African-American, yes. right? He, he, um, he said it was a defining moment. Another part of that story we uh, should probably talk about is that uh, Reagan later uh, in the diaries, you see that Reagan actually called uh, Thurgood Marshall to the White House and uh, spoke with him and to, for a Supreme Court justice to go to the White House pretty uh, different, didn't happen very often, but in that meeting with Thurgood Marshall, he uh, told him this Frankie Burkhardt story about this defining civil rights, human rights moment. And uh, that was something that also let, you know, just let, uh, Thurgood Marshall see the man behind the politician. Yeah, let me just say, one of the things that Reagan seems to do, he would do those things, but he wouldn't then, then tell people, look what I did. He just was quiet. He didn't do that. But he was the one who was making it possible for a lot of people to be leaking in. And, then, and there were a lot of times that we worked with him and saw what he did. And what he would do, he was making it possible for other people to be okay. I don't Let's, yeah. be, because Ronald Reagan had his formative years in, in Dixon and yeah. at Eureka College, let's take a look at the Ronald Reagan Museum that's located at Eureka College. Ronald Reagan was born in 1911 in Tampico, Illinois, and uh, shortly thereafter the family moved uh, to Dixon. Uh, the rest of his boyhood, the family moved back and forth between uh, the two towns, uh, but the, the school photo that you see uh, was taken uh, about that time. Uh, he came to Eureka College with some cash in his pocket, but to supplement his uh, education, he got a combination of scholarships and what would now be called work study. It wasn't called that at the time, but they, uh, basically it was compensation for work around campus. So he worked in the kitchen. After his freshman year, he qualified for a football scholarship, uh, which went further to supplement his education. In addition to football, he was on the swim team, in fact, for a while, he was the swim team. In addition to that, uh, Eureka College provided the basis for his political career. Uh, he was involved in some degree or another since his freshman year, uh, most notably uh, in his uh, years as a student, uh, involvement in the student senate, and in his senior year as a student, senate, or student body president. He was active in the Alpha Epsilon Sigma Dramatic Fraternity and was also involved in a number of dramatic productions, which of course prepared him for his future uh, as a Hollywood actor, and uh, one of the productions he was involved in was the uh, Aria de Capo. There was a tree on campus called the Recruiting Elm, and it was during the Civil War a rallying point for uh, the recruiting station here in uh, Woodford County, which was here on campus. Uh, many years later, the elm succumbed to 
uh, Dutch elm disease, and it finally had to be taken down in 1962. But this bowl was one of some a number of artifacts made from the elm, and this bowl was given to Ronald Reagan, and it sat on his desk in the Oval Office for both terms of his presidency. In his years when he was the uh, spokesman for the GE, or the General Electric Theater, uh, he was he was on a lot of advertisements, he was, uh, including uh, this Chesterfield cigarette ads. Now, it, he was not a cigarette smoker. He preferred a pipe when he did smoke, and that was very briefly in his college days. Ronald Reagan Speaks Out Against Socialized Medicine uh, was part of uh, uh, an initiative called Operation Coffee Cup, and literally, uh, People would gather in living rooms and have a coffee party, and the purpose was to listen to this recording of Ronald Reagan speaking out against socialized medicine. He came back for the centennial in 1955, and in 57 he came back for uh, to receive an honorary doctorate in uh, humane letters. And in this picture here, he's uh, meeting up with his old football coach Mac McKenzie, and uh, he about this time started thinking in terms of giving back to his alma mater uh, and not knowing that he'd become president someday but certainly he felt that uh, the, the college that he and the college had a special relationship and when he did become president uh, the museum became the logical place to honor this uh, uh, this, this fact that he had this lifelong relationship with the college. Uh, Brian you have helped uh, develop the museum Right, really, in a way, it's become part of my life, I suppose, uh, uh, for 18 years now, really putting it together. And some of the things that struck me is that uh, I, the socialized medicine piece I always chuckle at because, of course, that gathers great attention now. But, uh, you know, 18 years ago, when I put it in the display case, I just thought it was a really cool piece because it was a good graphic piece, basically, you know. And so people all think I was trying to make some point by sticking it in the case. It's been there for 18 years. But uh, the interesting thing about the collection is that. 90% of the items came from uh, President Reagan, and uh, he started giving us items in the late 40s. And I wrote him a letter when I was putting it together, because I knew he wrote a lot, and uh, uh, he wrote me back, I was within about three days, and I asked him, um, I had heard a rumor that he had personally sent these items, and he said, this is true, I kept a cardboard box next to my bed, starting in the 40s, you know, he was a creature of habit with these things, right, writing, for example, and he um, would fill that box up and tape it shut and send it to Eureka. And so, for all those years, uh, there were boxes arriving at Eureka that uh, a number of them hadn't been opened. And so, for example, I, I opened one of the boxes when I got there and it was his diploma. And so I wrote to him and I said, President Reagan, I want you to know we have your diploma, you know, your joint degree in economics and sociology. And uh, he wrote me back right away and said, I'm glad to know you have it, Brian. I'm still young. I may go for another job. It's good to know where my <laughs> references are. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned that he, he wrote true. a lot. Right. And, uh, uh, the, uh, the two Andersons have uh, had the opportunity to reflect back and uh, write uh, several books, including Reagan in His Own Hand and Reagan, A Life in Letters. And in addition, Reagan's Secret War, the untold story of his fight to save the world from nuclear disaster. And that's where I want to focus the conversation right now. Uh, but before we talk about this book, when Ronald Reagan was at Eureka College, he actually was a pacifist. Yes. That wasn't the, I mean, you, you wouldn't equate that with Ronald Reagan. He was a hawk. Mm. What woke him up? I think it's clear that he thought it was a terrible thing and you shouldn't do it. And then as he went through one major thing, which was in 80, 81, no, when, when he saw what happened with the Germans. And when he was through with that, and he was the one of the first, well, what did, what, what did he get right well, when, after when he, he came out? You know, he was drafted from Hollywood, yeah. and he went to work for the first motion picture unit of the Army Air Corps. And he, the, this unit received yeah. the initial film from the front that was being shot by uh, Army people, and it got sent back, and it was edited there before it went to the president and the generals in Hollywood. And one of the things he saw one of the films he saw was the first films of the Nazi concentration camps. Yeah, and, they and were, he was and deeply no, horrified they were, they were in, in, by in, that. In, in and terrible course, thing that they was he's he was he was seeing with these people what they had done right. to them, how they I mean just just awful. Mm -hmm. And at, after that, he simply said, 
Well, yeah, there are some things you have to do. And there are, and the horrors of nuclear war. And this and little war is talked about. He talked about that. Yeah. When he was at Eureka, it's, it's interesting, he recalls, and he told this story in 1987 when he was president. He recalls debating while he was washing dishes or in a classroom about whether it would ever be moral to use the capabilities that we developed in World War I, the air capabilities, to bomb civilians. And Reagan didn't think so. He told this story later in speeches, and he leaves out his own position. But he thought it was immoral to bomb civilians. And yet, in 1981, he was in a National Security Council meeting. He chaired 355 of these meetings, of which there are notes. And he asks what would happen if the Soviets bombed the United States, if they attacked. And he says 100, and he got the answer from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and it came back that 150 million people would would die would, in the United States, and maybe more later from after effects. And he was really uh, truly horrified uh, about that, and he knew what the dangers of nuclear war were, and he thought that it was a terrible thing. And so peace through strength. That's what sure. he came up with. That's basically, right. but one of the things he had he had done. He got, a, got enough people to agree with him, and they all agreed, and they stopped doing that. But those nuclear weapons Well, he were worked there. with the Soviets yeah. on, on reducing the number of nuclear weapons right. and avoiding nuclear well, war. Well, that's a key word, reduce, because up to right. 1983, if I recall, yes. it was just limiting the growth of nuclear mm -hmm. weapons. Every single year. Even up, 80, up, up to 86, up. Yes, even a couple of years after Gorbachev took office, and then he they spoke, were still He increasing. spoke in New York, I believe, uh, to a Jewish federation, and he, that was the first, in 1983. Oh, that, that was, was in 82. Oh, 82, okay. In and, and when said, said, no, we, that's not good enough. That's it's not good enough to control the growth. We don't want a, just a nuclear freeze. We want to actually reduce mm -hmm. and eventually right. eliminate. And again, that's what he and repeated in May at the graduation right. at Eureka. At uh, Eureka, right. right yeah. Where he talked about, right. I mean, it became Which, the where, Eureka speech, basically. That's right. No, that the the elimination thing, of an entire class yeah, of nuclear thing, weapons right. was yeah. what it was all we about. We haven't finished them all yet, but we did a tremendous one thing that Reagan did. He, bring, he, he took that at 80, 81 and just had them very slowly drop down, and so did the other people. And people all over this country, they're coming down. they still got some way to go. Let me read, uh, this is from Ronald Reagan in um, a note to Al, uh, Al Haig uh, at uh, the White House. Uh, when I told him I was thinking of writing a personal letter to Brezhnev, Al was reluctant to have me actually draft it. If I was going to send a letter, he said the State Department should compose it. As I was to learn over the next year, he didn't even want me as the president to be involved in setting foreign policy. <laughs> he didn't want to carry out the president's foreign policy. He wanted to formulate it and carry it out himself. Uh, Mr. Reagan bucked the system a little bit? Well, he did. He had his own views and goals. One of, one of the things he says after, after he uh, accepts Al Haig's resignation is that uh, Al Haig claims we disagreed, but the only thing we ever disagreed on was who was going to make policy. Yeah. <laughs> you mean he wasn't in charge? Yeah, here? that's right. No, no. And one of the things is that, 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 that he did that right off the bat when we discovered this. He just said, I will make all the decisions. And he did. And he was, right. he was the, well, what we have to under, understand about this guy is that for eight years, he decided what would happen. And he went, right. and there were various people, there were some of the really wonderful people that were working right in. And they were, they were on different sides, back and forth and back and forth. And Reagan would look at them and would decide which one he was going to do. And he would make them all the decisions. That left all the wonderful things that he did. But this is a hard thing to understand. And don't you think part of the, part of the uh, buck the system piece, and I'm sure it's cyclical, but he understood that uh, what he did, because he was the great communicator, is he'd go straight to the people and then say, okay, politicians, here's what the people think. You know, use the bully pulpit. I mean, right? So he was able to deliver his message in a powerful way in which people said, yeah, that's what we want. And then it was would be difficult for the opposition to get what they wanted, you know. It's a little more than that because there were a lot of people that did not allow him. Hmm. They did not like him. Some people didn't like what he was doing. And he said, no, this is the way to do it. 
And we have to understand that what he did, it all came out, we think, extremely well. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of people that did not like him. Sure. They thought he wouldn't do it. But he still, he, he just did it. And he, uh, he was the guy, as, as he said before, I will make all the decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, Annalise, let's, uh, let's talk about who liked Ronald Reagan and who didn't in terms of the Soviet leadership. If I recall, there were four Soviet premiers during the period of time that he was president. Right. And with the exception of Vantropov, did the other three, uh, Chernenko and uh, Brezhnev? Well, Brezhnev, Chernenko, Andropov, and then Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, the first three, Brezhnev had been in power for years and years. And uh, he died, and then and then we had Chernenko and Andropov. Andropov um, was a little bit paranoid and thought that the United States might engage in well, a first strike. Probably because he was the leader of the KGB. I, <laughs> right, right. He was <laughs> KGB there's, and because, there's, there's because only one he was thing. He was a lot that way, not a little bit. He was right. getting really he good. He was a lot that way. But, 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 okay. Did Reagan have an ability to communicate with them well, that he helped? Tried. He yes. tried. He oh, tried. Yes. You know, he wrote letters. He wrote a letter to Brezhnev in his own hand. Uh, what turned out to be a four-page letter right after he got shot when he got out of the hospital. He wrote that to Brezhnev. Um, that's the one where, where Al Haig thought he should be writing the letter, but, but Reagan wrote it and sent it. He actually wrote to Andropov, and he wanted to invite Chernenko. He wanted him to come to the Olympics in Los Angeles. And in fact, Chernenko was too sick to travel. He had very bad emphysema. Reagan didn't know that right then. And finally, it, uh, you know, one interpretation of the coming on the scene of Gorbachev is that they needed to find someone who could negotiate with Reagan and with a newly empowered United States that was stronger economically and militarily. We were growing, we were, you know, getting into computers, doing all kinds of new stuff. And the United States was really um, on a roll. And they needed someone who could effectively work with Ronald Reagan, and they picked Gorbachev as a younger, more more westernized leader who could understand what was going on in the United States. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about the Eureka Museum just for a moment again, because there are a series of quotes that are up on the walls over there, and one in particular I want to show uh, the audience. Uh, this particular quote uh, reads, we are a nation that has a government, not the other way around. And that makes us special among the nations of the earth. Uh, he seemed to grasp that the government, it, it, as a matter of fact, he turned the way the economy worked around and made it individual based and rather than government based. Right. The sort of the individual, the power of the individual, that, that's even where I think we get that uh, you know, that myth of the individual California, you know, the cowboy feeling from, you know, that the, the power, it's kind of what uh, Martin referred to earlier, that we, America, we believe, will make it right. We'll, it will work. We may struggle at times, but the individual can make the difference. And, and on that note, I remember when President Gorbachev uh, was walking through the museum and I was at a particular case with him and he saw a photograph of he and Reagan at uh, Geneva. And it was just he and I standing there and he kind of, he got teary eyed and he kind of looked down and I felt the need to help. And I said, you know, I know you, you're looking at that photo and you, you know, he's, there he is in it. I mean, that's, he remembers the time. And I said, you wonder, does an individual make a difference? And here you are, the former president of the Soviet Union standing in central Illinois, um, you know, 20 some years later. Yeah, an individual makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And so um, those quotes really, when I put them up 18 years ago, again, I really was trying to choose quotes that uh, showed us, you know, different, a different Reagan. You know, one who, he said these things, but it wasn't what we heard all the time in the news, you know. Mm -hmm. We're almost sure. out of time, and I know that both Annalise and Martin are economists. So your very brief, uh, you worked Office of Management Budget, so mm -hmm. very briefly, did Ronald Reagan have a different grasp of how the economy should work in this country? Well, I think he had a lot of confidence in the American people and in the free enterprise and what they could achieve if if the government got out of the way in terms of regulation and taxes, and, and he did that. 
And so he, re he created an economy that was uh, yeah. in great shape for 25 years. And let me just ask this. He learned how to do that here. That is what he did. That is what he got a degree in. And that is a wonderful thing that when he got out of that, he knew a lot about that. So what we had is a very, very rare thing where the person comes in and he knows what the hell to do. And that's an appropriate place to stop. Uh, February 6th, his 100th birthday, had he be, uh, been alive, mm -hmm. and there's a right. celebration at Eureka? Big birthday party, Super Bowl party. Uh, it's February 6th is also the birthday of the college. And so uh, from 1 to 10.30 p.m., uh, the public is welcome, college students, uh, a big uh, celebration. And with that, we thank uh, Dr. Brian Psycho, who is, uh, uh, wears many hats at Eureka College, just leave it at that. Thanks. And to Annalise Anderson and to Martin Anderson from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, thank you, thank you so much for your insight into the life of Ronald Reagan. Thank you, H. And with that, we thank you for joining us on At Issue, and we'll be back next week with another edition. Please join us then.